and uh, welcome to Face to Face as a special United Nations debate on education, human rights and conflict, a subject I'm sure you all agree is very important. I'm Imogen folks here at UN headquarters in Geneva. Welcome to our audience. Welcome also to our viewers around the world. In a moment, we're going to hear from our panel of experts about the impact of conflict on the education of children around the world. And as, as we've heard in the speeches already, education is a basic human right wherever you're living and whatever kind of peace or war situation you are living in. We'll hear from our panelists first, but we will also in the second half hour allow you to put your questions as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing what they are. Today's debate coincides with the United Nations Economic and Social Council's annual ministerial review on implementing the internationally read goals and commitments in regard to education. It's sponsored by various UN bodies, including the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, and UNESCO, the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, and let's not forget uh, UN Television as well. Now, to talk about the complexities of conflict in education, we're privileged today to have a really distinguished panel. I'll just uh, introduce them quickly. In the middle there, uh, Asma Jahangir. Many of you may know her already. She's a lawyer by profession, an advocate of the Supreme Court in Pakistan. Now, next to her, we have Tobe Wang, Chief Executive Officer of Save the Children, She's also chair of uh, Save the Children's first global campaign known as Rewrite the Future. I'd also like to welcome Professor Mamadou Diouf. He is Leitner Family Professor of African Studies and Director of the Institute of African Studies at Columbia University. And finally, we also have uh, Ambassador Lazarus Kapambwe. He'll be joining us as well for today's discussion. So, as I'm sure you'll agree, very distinguished panel. Could you just put your hands together quickly to welcome them? Take the time with us. But before we start the debate proper, we have a small film we'd like to show you about the way conflict does impact children around the world. Sixty-seven million children around the world are not in primary school. Around 53% are girls. Violent conflict has a direct impact on whether girls and boys go to school. Almost 30 million children in conflict-ridden countries do not attend school. During Burundi's civil war, hundreds of thousands of children witnessed atrocities that scarred them for life. I saw combatants cutting throats. I was horrified, jumping over dead bodies. Donation was forcefully recruited as a child soldier while still a boy. This violated his human rights to a basic education. During the conflict, the school system was crippled. But years later, it's up and running, and young Burundians are back in school, catching up with their lessons and thinking of their future. In Cambodia, during the Khmer Rouge regime, teachers and students risked their lives if caught reading books or performing traditional dances. During the Khmer Rouge, everyone, not, not only me, you cannot tell them I'm a teacher, no. I'm the worker. Because the 75 to 80 percent of our teacher was killed during the Khmer Rouge regime. Schools were turned into prisons and torture centers. More than three decades later, the situation is improving. Volunteers are being trained, and some parents are coming forward to serve as teachers. But most children are fortunate to learn and lead normal lives. Here, in Egypt, Yusriya is getting a chance to go to school. Her older sister was deprived of an education. Now, Yusriya teaches her sister. Education is great. 
After ten years, I will have finished school. I will have finished college, and God willing, I will be a doctor. God willing. Attending primary school has motivated Yusriya to dream about her future. All children must be able to complete primary school. It's a basic human right. Critical in nurturing a culture of peace, developing their skills and enriching their lives. Okay, well, I think that gave us a, a brief overview of what is, remains a very, a very big issue, a very big problem. I'd like to go straight to our panelists now. We heard there was one phrase in that film that said, um, the situation is improving. I'd, I'd like to ask you all whether you genuinely think the situation is improving, and if yes, why? If not, what are the big gaps? Toby Wang, I'd like to ask you first. In general, of course, the situation is improving because more and more children are getting into school. But the great concern is, as we have heard here, the 28 million children living in conflict area are not going to school. And then we have learned that an average length of a conflict is 12 years. I mean, that constitutes three generations of primary school children. Then obviously it's a big problem. Uh, when I have traveled around uh, the last five years in 20 conflict countries to work on education, what really, really has impressed me and made an impression on my mind is the resolve that children and parents are showing to maintain and provide education during the conflict. Uh, I met this one father in Afghanistan who was standing in front of his village school and he said to me, if they come to close this school, they will have to take me down first. And it wasn't his son who went to school, which we often think, it was his daughter who went to that school. And I would really like to see us as the INGO community and donor community and host governments show the same kind of resolve. Uh, we cannot afford to wait for peaceful situation to provide education. We have to dare the risk of providing education during conflict. We would like to see it end, but we also have to stand there and stay to deliver when the conflict is ongoing. Otherwise, we will never, ever reach education for all. Asma Jahangir, how do you think we do that, uh, provide education for all children in a country, for example, like Afghanistan, where you have not just a conflict, but one section of society which isn't interested in girls going to school at all? I do agree with Ms. Wang when she says that people are very interested and people really do want their children to go to school. There is a, uh, a special kind of society, not only in Afghanistan, but in other parts of the world also, that have placed taboos on female children going to school. And we have to be able to challenge that mentality. I think this is side by side, not just opening up schools for children to come and give them any kind of education. I would stress that the right to education is a right to have quality education and the right to have education without discrimination. And therefore, the uh, work as, or the challenge before the international community is not simply to make buildings, but also to be able to ensure that what goes into these buildings is not indoctrination, but it does prepare a child for a pluralistic society, and then to be able to contest those individuals or groups that believe that certain sections of society like girl child should not be allowed to go to school. Now, how do you do it in a place like Afghanistan, which is very much also in some parts of my country where I come from, we have similar problems. But I think that uh, when there is internal conflict, when there are people going internally displaced, one of the first things that have to be set up is schools, because it is important not only for the child, but also for the family. And in Afghanistan, the mindset, not only of people, but of those governments, has to be very correct and courageous so that they are able to, uh, uh, you know, tell those uh, forces that stop 
girl child from going to school, that this is not going to be tolerated. So it has to be basically toler to zero tolerance from the government and a message, a very clear message out there for people that this is not going to be tolerated. Professor Juf, I'd like to bring you in there because I know uh, from, from the notes you submitted before this conference, you're, you're very interested in how you, you square the circle, if you like, sometimes between what we consider or some people might consider to be universal human rights and the cultural uh, norms in a particular country. So how, how easy do you think it is to, to go into a country and say, well, we have zero tolerance of this? Girls going to school, for example, or not going to school. I think it's an important issue precisely because even if we agree that you have values which are universal, which could be applied to any human societies, ways in which they are deployed in very, very specific cultures and circumstances need to be taken into account. If I take the example of societies I know better, which are African societies, the main tension in relation to human rights, it's tension between individual and community rights, between individual rights has expressed and developed by a Western traditions and societies in which education norms are attached to, to, to group identity. So the issue is how do you deal with such tension and how do you make such tension productive and creative? And it's where education is key because it allows to actually open up a kind of approach which allows you in societies which are already divided in Africa, a plural way of dealing with tension. It's also important to note that in Africa in particular, which is very different compared to the situation in Asia, where education is performed through Western language, the tension between what you can call instruction way of learning a skill is very different from education, ways in which as a citizen you are actually located within a society and you deal with specific issues. And, and, and this is important in particular in Africa for, for, for girl education. It's also important in societies which are socially and economically unequal, where you have to make choices and create large coalitions to carry the mission of education in a plural basis. Ambassador Kabambwe, do you, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, donor countries, for example, are they sensitive enough when they talk, they come into countries in conflict and say, this is a universal human right and this is how it should be applied? I think we are not sensitive enough, all of us. Uh, this morning, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom was talking about broken promises, broken trust, and broken dreams. I think that uh, when it comes to education, we still are of the mindset that there is them and there is us. I don't think that we see the education of children as a collective responsibility for all of us. This is a problem in the least developed countries. It is not what happens there doesn't seem to affect what happens in these other places. And yet, the practice is the contrary. The least developed countries are investing about 16 to 20 years in educating their children to a level of uh, first degree. And these children end up migrating to the north 
where the North invests one or two years in giving them postgraduate studies, and yet these kids stay in the North and deprive the environments that uh, uh, spend so much on them from the benefit of that education. I also feel that we are not addressing sufficiently the issue of vulnerable groups. And in this particular case, I would like to cite refugees and IDPs. Because mentally, we are in this mindset where we see the displacement as a very temporary problem. And yet, the experience on the ground is that uh, conflict situations take such a long time that when we do not focus on the education of those kids that are displaced, we are actually losing a generation. And I, I, I find it very difficult uh, to accept when I know that the world has sufficient resources to resolve these problems. You bring me on very neatly, in fact, to another topic that I know you, you all wanted to talk about, and that is indeed resources, because very often when we talk about conflict, the, the focus is on food and medicines, and education is, tends to sometimes be seen as a developmental issue that can come afterwards. So, again, I'm, I am going to begin with you, Tovi Wang, and then we'll move on. The, the funding for education in conflict. How does that reflect our apparent commitment to making sure that education continues during a conflict? Well, first of all, just to say that, of course, education as part of emergency response or humanitarian response is now on people's agenda, and that's good. So if they're moving in the right direction, it could move faster, but it's going in the right direction. When it comes to funding um, education in conflict situation, we know, we have heard several times today, that 28 million children live in conflict-affected areas. This constitutes 42% of the children out of school. But guess what? Only 21% of the funding actually goes towards this 42% of children. So there is a hesitation to invest in conflict situations. It's more risky. It's more costly, let's be honest about it. And you won't necessarily get your need reports on time and things will not necessarily happen according to a need plan. But these are children that have exactly the same right to education and will benefit immensely from education. So we shouldn't sort of stick to all these long uh, traditional ways of doing it. We have to be more flexible, pull out when it's too complicated, but stay over time in order to ensure uh, education also for children, uh, children in conflict. And a lot of uh, arguments go along the line that it's too costly. I would claim that it might be too costly not to invest in education in conflict areas. Ambassador Kabambwe, though, I mean, you, you're here, you're a, a UN person. How do you think member states, the wealthy ones, can be persuaded that education is, 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 a, is a good investment, um, even though they won't see it maybe on the TV as immediately as they'll see their, their bandages or their doctors or nurses arriving? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, somebody asked me a question, why is it that uh, there is not sufficient attention in terms of resources that are going to education versus those that are going to health? I said because there are no television pictures to show uh, images of dead people uh, in, when, when you're dealing with education. But then the death that occurs from lack of education is much more devastating to the society, not just uh, to the individual. The answer to your question, in my view, would be that we need to follow where resources are. And I believe that in the private sector, there are a lot of resources. We have focused uh, education, particularly in the developing countries, only as a responsibility of governments or largely as a responsibility of governments. I would like, during the discussions uh, at this session, for us to explore the idea that in the developed countries, they should start creating incentives for their private sector to go and invest in least developed countries. If, for instance, we could have tax breaks for those uh, companies that invest in education and which are located in the developed countries, I think more and more companies, more and more private sector would, would be involved in education. Thank you.
to just come back to the first point you made, uh, Asma Jahangir and Professor Duf. Um, is it your experience, or would you argue forcefully, that, that not investing in education can, in the long term, even the short term, fuel conflict? Investing in the wrong kind of education can also fuel conflict. What's the wrong kind of education? Well, for example, you have now reports about people and children being put in school where they have been taught to hate other communities, to kill even other communities, to isolate themselves, and this has ultimately led to a large number of violent acts and conflict in Pakistan, for example, as well as in Afghanistan. So, that, therefore, I insist that it's not just any kind of education. The education has to be one that prepares a child to live as a citizen of the world. And that has to be the thrust of that education. And secondly, when you were, were talking about, for example, giving money and be, for, to donor agencies, sometimes I, my experience has been on the ground that community-led initiatives do not receive money. I have seen during conflict uh, situations, three women get together and start a little school so that the children next door can come and study. And let us also recall the brave women during the Taliban period in Afghanistan who set up schools for women, for girl children, despite the fact that they could have been punished dearly for this uh, act of theirs. But they, I see, do not get foreign funding, nor do they get any, any initiative or any funding from governments because they are unable to write a report which suits funders. And therefore, I think that something, some friendly kind of funding initiative has to be carried on for community workers that are doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, so these home schools and plus, I think, that more than foreign donors, it has to be national and domestic governments that really must have the willpower and the priority attached to education because nobody from outside can make them do it unless they do not attach that priority and that they do not begin to feel that this is the kind of education we need and everybody can be guided by the Toledo principles that have been formed or made by, the UN by UNESCO itself so that uh, education that leads to a tolerant society can be imparted to children as well as to adolescents because I insist that in our country it's not only children, many adolescents are illiterate and during times of conflict they need uh, education more than anyone else. Professor Duf, I'm interested in the, very, the last words that uh, Ms. Jahangir said, education for a tolerant society and I think without wishing to kind of criticize anyone or anything, people's uh, definitions of tolerance are different. Tolerance uh, uh, is different, but the issue is much more about managing diversity, managing pluralism in order to make sure that people can live together making the options which are theirs without feeling pressured. And I think it's key for education is why specifying which type of education is very, very important. Because we can have an open, culturally, you know, sound education, but which is not actually attending the issue of managing diversity, attending the issue of respecting pluralism in order to respect human rights. And, 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 and of course, I think also it's why education is a community, local, and national responsibility. It's not a responsibility for donors because each country, each community needs to define its own and implement his own educative project. It's why the example she gave is very important, the way in which also in East Africa, women invested in education show the clear choices they made for their own communities. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the audience who have been very patient. It is going to be... Uh,
your turn now. We'll take questions from the floor and some questions uh, that we have received online. Questions from the floor. I did see one at the back, and I think it's UNRWA. Your question, please. Hi, I'm Caroline Pontefract. I'm the Director of Education in UNRWA, and thanks to the, the DG of UNESCO alluded to UNRWA earlier. UNRWA is a UN agency set up in 1948 to provide humanitarian and development services to the Palestinian refugees in Syria, Jordan, West Bank, Gaza and Lebanon. Um, we, at the focus of those services is education and uh, social sector and health. I wanted to actually ask a question to the panel because we've been providing education, you know, thanks to UNESCO who, who started the program in the 1950s, we've been providing quality education over the last 60 years. We've got 500,000 kids in schools across the region in the five fields, we've got 10 teacher training colleges and we actually have 20,000 educators of whom themselves are Palestine refugees. We see delivery of education both as a human right and also we try to deliver education about human rights. I wanted to particularly highlight that it's very Question. unusual, the UNRWA, because it's a protracted conflict area. So we, we live in a protracted conflict, which obviously impacts very differently from Gaza. We have kids under a blockade. We have occupation in West Bank. We have relative stability in Jordan. And I wanted to ask the, the panel, in, given that the protracted conflict area, which is very different from some of the situations we've been talking about, given the nature of the protracted conflict, and the impact it has on, on children's day-to-day -day lives and the fact that we move from a humanitarian to development perspective um, uh, frequently, you know, frequently between the two, to actually ask for their advice in terms of what would you say in terms of education reform and trying to strengthen the quality of our education, which is what we're embarking on, what would you suggest are the kind of principles, policies, practices and priorities for an education system in this challenging, evolving context, in the context of a 60-year-old conflict? It's a tough question, and I'm not sure I have a very good answer. Obviously, it's one of the arguments we use uh, in order to provide education in a conflict situation is to maintain a hope for a future. If a conflict has been going on for 60 years, I can see that that's a challenge. So I'm not sure I have very good advice for you, um, apart from the fact that I'm sure you are aware that the education that you are providing is creating some normalcy for children while they go to school. And actually that's one of the main reasons for why it's so important to maintain education during conflict as well. But I'm sorry, I don't really have a good answer to how to reform education in a conflict that has lasted for 60 years. I think one has to do something else than reform education and, you know, have a wider approach to it. <laughs> I think that education is not only simply in classrooms as well. So unfortunately many of the children who live in armed conflict situation are being educated adversely or for the better for them outside of classrooms as well. So when they're in the formal education uh, system, I would say that it is important to share their worries because children sort of clamp up in conflict situations they don't talk and classroom is a place where they can communicate with teachers and um, peers of their own age and as uh, Ms. Wang said to keep their hopes up but more importantly what I have learned from experiences of my colleagues back home is that they find it very difficult and challenging to keep these children out of isolation because they get isolated within themselves, then they get isolated as a family, and then they feel that they are the only ones in the world who are being tortured in this manner or being treated in this manner. And to be able to take them out so that they can speak up, and that is the time when you need to bring to them the emphasis that they have rights and they have freedom of expression, and they must talk, and these are rights that they must value for themselves. And I think that at that particular time, it is extremely important for a child to be able to get these gifts that they feel that they do have rights and that they are not only going to be victims. So a victimized mentality is something that you need to bring children out of. Thank you. I was trained as a historian, and I think one of the issues which are fueling conflict is the way in which as adults we pass our own memories to our children. 
And this is something we have to break up and propose, you know, uh, a discussion which is much more complex and which allow them actually to establish bridges and made up their own mind about what is going on. Okay, well, related, in fact, we've got an interesting question which has been sent to us online from Francis Nkulu from Cameroon, who says, how can educational programs be developed to overcome inequalities which are often one of the main sources of conflict? Asma Jahangir. It is difficult. Uh, for example, in a number of countries, education, the medium of language is different, uh, which has created two different societies altogether and therefore gaps between these societies, different economic sections. Plus um, inequalities in the sense that when you have certain communities living in a certain compound itself, particularly of uh, minorities, whether they're ethnic or religious minorities, there the schooling system somehow is the worst kind that has been put up either by private sector or by the government. And then they only meet people of their own community and therefore uh, they do not have access in the, in the real sense to other avenues of state craft. So I think that inequality is just not in terms of language but in terms of ensuring that all schools do not only cater to people living around them uh, is the answer because everybody who's rich will have a better schooling system and those that are poor will have a poor schooling system. Um, and more, or more than that, I think after school, um, this sort of irons out more or less in um, universities and uh, higher education. But at all levels, I believe that it has to be looked at and plus I believe that uh, teachers who are teaching in schools which are in areas where people are less fortunate, if I may use that word, should be paid better and given more incentive. Ambassador Kapambwe, do you agree with that last point in particular? Yeah, well, what I can say is that uh, um, we say that education is a human right, and therefore it's not something that we should just leave to uh, children we need to educate everybody because it is in conditions of ignorance and illiteracy that you have the most negative uh, uh, things being put out, the most negative views, the most intolerant uh, views. So I believe that uh, we would be helping many societies eliminate the elements that constitute the cultures of conflict in many of these uh, uh, you know, societies if we can extend education beyond just thinking about uh, children. Thank you. Another question from the floor. Thank you very much. I am the permanent representative of Mexico to the United Nations in New York. I'd like to inject a dimension that hasn't been touched on. I'm talking about prevention of conflict and the importance of education. A lot has been said about education during situations of conflict, the need for flexible mechanisms, and for the preservation of the education system. What I'd like to introduce is post-conflict situations. As chairperson of the Working Group on Children in Armed Conflict, I have chaired that group in 2009 and 2010 and in the Security Council. And one of the situations that we've seen on the ground was a situation in Nepal where there was a process of demobilization of some 5,000 children. I think that the factor of reintegration of these children into the education system, children who are actually involved in armed conflict, is a key element, and I think that this is one issue that needs to be fully appreciated in the context of these discussions. Could I, yes, Tovar, can you comment on that? You know, when, when, when we get the peace, how can we use education to, to build on that? We did a research once looking through all peace agreements for the last, I think it was 10, 15 years, and we found that very, very few peace agreements actually included anything on education. And we know that peace agreements and peace processes uh, rises high expectations in people, and rightly so. And I think education is one uh, element that could help meet these expectations. So I think uh, thinking about education uh, also post-war and in peace negotiations is extremely important.
But just one more point, and that is, I think the whole issue of equal access is also conflict, uh, prevent, prevents conflict. So uh, equity and equal access is a key element to you know, assist in, in preventing conflicts around the world. Asma Jahangir, I saw you nodding there. I absolutely agree that post-conflict situation is extremely important, otherwise we fall back into conflict and that vicious cycle continues to carry on. And there have been several initiatives that have been taken, as you said, in Nepal, as it was pointed out in Nepal, also in my own country and in some other countries where reintegration of children uh, has been attempted, I should say, because so far we have not got a program and a model which other countries could follow with greater ease. Uh, my own observation in my own country and through other colleagues who worked in this area is that reintegration really when they started, the reintegration mostly of the boy child, so to speak, or adolescent boy, is carried out by men. And it is very important that women are, you know, a part of that reintegration scheme because uh, they, at, at the point, at the point of post-conflict, they do need that to see women and to see their perspective and to have that particular special touch that women can give towards peace and uh, towards ending of conflict. So I do think that that is one of the things that we need to work at and to find better ways of reintegration. Some of the ones that I have had witness to has worried me no end because it's being done by people in arms themselves. So that really is hardly a way of, uh, uh, of reintegrating a person to a peaceful society or a society which, as my friend has said, that uh, negotiates with a more pluralistic and diverse society. So it, I think multiple disciplines have to be brought in. Civilians must be doing the reintegration and predominantly by women is what I would say is something to start with. Thank you. Okay, I want to take, we're moving back a little bit from post-conflict to in conflict, but this is a question I, I, I sent in online that I, I did really want to include because this is something reporting I've seen myself. In conflicts, public sector workers, health, doctors, teachers have increasingly become targets. And we have a question from Max Gilbert, who's from the United States. He says, attacks on education occur around the world inside and outside of situations of armed conflict, armed groups intentionally target schools, teachers and students. What can we do about that? If somebody is determined to make a region untenable, ungovernable. Let me put it this way, that we've seen that this is a pattern and this is part of a strategy. Because what is being attempted is to uh, to, to, to uh, divorce the society from intellectual input or from professional input or from even cultural debates and, um, uh, uh, you know, cultural uh, uh, development. So I think that the governments have to be very um, vigilant about it. In my own country, many of the girls' schools have been bombarded time and again but they are the last to be rebuilt. So if the government started to build them first, rather than a secretariat, that would be a message. And secondly, schools are not given protection. Other places are given protection. Schools are the last to be given protection during an armed conflict. So the message has to be there. The protection towards the intellectual side of society uh, is something that governments have to think about because we see doctors being killed, teachers being killed, professors being killed, human rights activists being killed, nurses being killed, uh, simply because they want to cleanse society of a organized civil society. And uh, this is a strategy that governments will have to look at when they are setting up a counter-terrorism mechanisms and counter-terrorism policies. Professor Duf. Do you have any solutions for this? I, I think one of the solutions is to make sure that society as a whole is, is mobilized. Society as a whole is, 
actually aware of the importance of such infrastructure on one hand, but also the importance of educated people as a force which is opening up society. And it's why this, the site is targeted, is why also the human resources constituted by those people are targeted. How do we deal with that? I think the best way to deal with that is precisely to educate people to make sure that they can actually solve their difference through dialogue and through a constructive conversation. Tove, when you wanted to come in there. Uh, just to build on what Mr. Diouf is saying, I think one of our key learnings over the last few years is, and I don't want to sound naive about this, but it is when you really have community involvement and the community owns the education system and maybe have built the schools themselves, the school is actually less likely to be attacked. Uh, it still happens, but it's less likely. If the community really stands behind the education programs, uh, I think that both students, teachers, and even staff are better protected. So one of the key learnings for us is really community ownership and anchoring it. And sometimes it's very possible, sometimes not. I think the good examples that have been brought forward in this conference, and it's Nepal mentioned several times, where the actual negotiations took place between the Maoists, the government forces, and the communities, and they actually agreed on saving the schools for learning and not allowing any occupation or any attacks on the way to school or in school. And that has been declared, as you have heard, a national policy in Nepal. So let's sort of take hope and encouragement from that situation. More points from the floor. We have time for a couple more. Greece. I have been intrigued by the argument that the private sector should invest in uh, LDCs. And uh, I also heard the same argument put forward that after 12 years of state education, uh, the graduates go to another country, get a graduate degree, and then get hired uh, uh, in those countries. So my, my question is, uh, what kind of incentives uh, would these private companies have since they can get them uh, very cheaply, obviously, by having 12 years of state education paid by another country. Um, and if so, uh, what kind of curricula uh, have to be designed to make those uh, graduates attractive uh, to um, um, uh, their own countries or, to, um, or elsewhere? Presumably, uh, they would like to hire them in the future. Thank you. One more point from the floor, and then I'll have the panelists respond to Kenya. Thank you. For I've, I've been in a situation where I've had to deal with uh, such a post-conflict, in-conflict and post-conflict emergencies. One area that I would like the panelists to come out quite clearly, the amount of psycho-emotional liability that occurs in children in conflict and post-conflict situation is immense. That any amount of just curriculum delivery may not be enough to be able to address that critical area of learning. So my question to them is, what is your view and role of guidance and peace education in the interactive process in order to prepare these children for enabling learning. Thank you. Okay, can we take the, the, the first question first. I'd like to ask you, Ambassador Kapambui, the issue of, of, of the brain drain, which the delegate from Greece brought up. Oh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, immigration or migration is a human right as well. And uh, we, any uh, approaches that simply emphasize preventing of people moving will not be successful. And so it is important for us to accept this and therefore act on it in the following ways. Once it is acknowledged in the developed countries that the developing countries are actually training those that work in the developed countries, then uh, assistance to education as a component of ODA could go higher, number one. Number two, 
in addition to the fact that the companies in the developed countries benefit from the training of these uh, uh, individuals in the develop, uh, developing uh, world, that incentive can also be given additional incentives uh, by, like I said, creating tax breaks. In addition to the fact that they benefit from uh, the, this workforce, if they can demonstrate that they are moving resources directly into education in developing countries, then they can also qualify for additional tax breaks on that component of assistance which has gone to the developing uh, countries. And how can we uh, attract the, um, uh, the, the graduates to stay in their own countries? Well, there are issues that we must deal with in the supply, you know, from the supply side in the developing countries, uh, in improving conditions of service for these people. But some, sometimes the conditions of service in the developing countries, it's not just the salaries, but it's the kind of infrastructure and uh, equipment that these people have to work with, which they do not find attractive. And so if we can move sufficient resources from the private sector and the uh, donor community, then we can improve on the facilities and the aids that these people have to use, which will make, therefore, the environment much more attractive. The second question I'd like to ask you, Tovi Wang, psychological or psychosocial support for children who've been in conflict. Well, this is one of the key questions we have to address when we actually provide education. And it's not just for children in conflict, it's also children who have uh, has, uh, experienced uh, major humanitarian disasters. I mean, it's, it's an immense impact on children. And that is why it's so important to start with education very early after a disaster or early also in a conflict situation and not wait for things to settle. I think we have situations where children have special needs such as having had traumatic experiences. So sensitivity, irrelevant curriculum, and an experience around this area. Uh, so I think it's, it's possible to deliver that. Did you have something to add? I would like to add something about the brain drain, because I'm, I'm part of a brain drain, let's say. So. And, and I think it's much more complicated than usually we present it, because it's much more about Africans being part of a larger world and participating in the global world in which people are moving. And each country from India to China, Malaysia, have been trying to address the same issue. How, which type of responses they are devising, facing a phenomenon which is global is very important. Today the issue is to basically know what are African government thinking about that and which type of answers they are coming up with? Because in many cases, we're dealing with brain drain in Africa, in West Africa I know better, is precisely, at least for scholars by tribe, it's about creating uh, possibilities for them to do their work. And one of the responses is a simple response, is creating regional universities with resources. It's very simple and not complicated. Okay, last comment for you and then we're going to have to start yeah, moving I just wanted to add to some of the lists that uh, already Ms. Wong has given. I think that children after post-conflict, they need sports, they need dialogue, which is very important because often the, it's the elderly or the elder people who sit down and have dialogue, but you don't have children having dialogue with each other and then speaking up so that they can speak their experiences out. And I think they also need a change of environment. We need to introduce them to music, song, dance, cultural events, which is very important. And it's an antidote to, uh, you know, really getting hard and getting used to conflict. So I think these are some of the things that I would like to add to see this happen in any place where children are there in a post-conflict situation. Okay, well, we've just about reached almost the end 
of our debate, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to sum up, reflecting on some of the uh, points that have been raised this afternoon. And as you do it, try and incorporate perhaps a little reply to our very last online question, which is from uh, Isabel Lapan in Australia, who says very bluntly, do countries really take children's rights seriously? Ambassador Kapambwe, I'll, I'll start with you. You have about a minute each, just, just to sum up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to believe that uh, we do take uh, the rights of uh, uh, people very seriously, including those of children. For many of us in the developing countries, there is always this paucity of resources to spend on all the needs that we have. And we find that uh, in the prioritization, uh, only emergency issues tend to receive attention. But it is not for the fact that we do not understand the importance of uh, uh, the, the rights of children. But uh, just to pick up on what the uh, professor said about the environment that Africa is existing in an international, in a global uh, village, it is important to address the many challenges in the relationship between the developing and the developing uh, world in issues relating to trade because unless we resolve these issues, the capacity of the least developed countries to earn sufficient resources for them to apply to their own needs will not be uh, uh, guaranteed. I'd like to address the question from Australia by trying to be diplomatic and say that children's rights should be taken more seriously than they are today. Uh, there is a lot of room for improvement. Uh, in many sectors, including education. Um, I'd like to spend my minute on trying to demystify education in conflict situations. We might think it's a very complicated and undoable thing. It is not. Uh, Save the Children has, over the last five years, reached out to 10 million children in conflict situations in 20 countries, and we are determined to create 3 million new places in school to bring new children into, into school. It, it takes comprehensive approaches over time. It takes investment and willingness to stay and deliver. And I know that we are not often like to talk about money, but it also takes money. We do need more funding of education in conflict situations to get there. And I'd just like to end by saying that education for all is a very simple statement. There is not one word in that statement that is not possible to understand. I am not going to be so diplomatic because I think that mostly I have seen politicians of all countries use children as a photo opportunity. There is hardly anything that I have seen sincerity or perseverance either in their policy or in their words which does not even need resources to make a meaningful uh, plea to people saying or address the child community itself. This is my perception that governments in many parts of the world, I'm not saying all governments, have somehow left the rights of the child for the NGOs and the INGOs to deliver. And I think it's about time that they understood that this is not primarily their responsibility, but responsibility of governments. And secondly, even crime against children is not always documented. If you look at the number of children who are missing, who are trafficked, number of children who have been made camel jockeys, who have been killed, uh, you hardly find criminal records about children. So I think that they do live, even today, very painful lives, and it is time to have a more political will to address truly the rights of the child. If they are serious. It's not a sweet thing anymore. And we cannot only leave them to INGOs and NGOs, though they are doing an admirable work, but governments have certain responsibilities and a certain way of delivery. I wish I could have said yes to the last question, not only for the right of children, but for the right of everybody, in particular in, in African situation. You, as you know, you know, the revolution of human rights begins in the 60s and it has been changing and fluctuating from one, you know, from one moment to another. But the right of children, in particular in Africa, with references to, and this needs to be said, uh, 
to what we call our traditional values. The idea of listening to a child is very problematic. This is also one of the revolution we need to promote in Africa, and education should have an important part of, in that. It's why, for me, one of the most important lessons is to make sure that we establish a continuum in education from the family to the nation. To, to make sure that values are disseminated and these values are the same value. It's why the state has still a pivotal role to play in education in Africa. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid that is all we have time for. My apologies to those in the audience and online who didn't get to put their questions, but uh, as I'm sure you understand, we do have a limited time frame. So thank you to our panelists who I think gave us a really well-informed and, and provocative uh, debate. Um, thanks to everybody around the world who watched. Thanks to the audience. We hope to see you next year for our next debate. Until, until then, from me, Imogen folks, and from everybody here at the UN in Geneva and in New York, thanks for joining us.